It is so good to talk about Jesus. Are you ready for the word today? Yes. All right. I want to share with you something that the Lord began to put on my spirit a few weeks ago. I, I've been doing a series on my podcast of looking at Old Testament stories through New Covenant lens, taking a, an examination of Old Testament texts, of scriptures, chapters, verses, stories, highlights, and then putting on my sort of my lens of what I know happens to that through Christ and his finished work. Because when Jesus dies on the cross, resurrects from the dead and ascends to the Father, then descends into the church at Pentecost. That part always gets left out for some reason too. We talk about Christ died, was buried, raised, and went to, and we always put him seated at the right hand of the Father. But I think we skip Pentecost where he shows up in his church through the Holy Spirit and hasn't went anywhere since still living in us. And since he lives in us, and we believe that, that changes the way our eyes work. Because when we open them, we open them as new creations with Christ in us, the hope of glory. So therefore, we don't look at Old Testament scriptures as we would as if we didn't have Christ in us. We look at Old Testament scriptures as you would if you had Christ in you and realizing my Christ has already come to affect that story. My Christ has already come, in some cases, to fulfill that story. I would even argue that a lot of things we're putting out in our future going, won't it be wonderful when Christ does that, that I think Christ has already done that and will do that in us if we'll open our eyes through that lens. So as I walked through those Old Testament stories, I got into one of my favorite Old Testament books, the book of Zechariah. And in Zechariah, there are highlights of prophetic voices, stuff that happens that preludes Jesus there's, a, there's fantastic moments in Zechariah that can't be fulfilled until the cross. Jesus tells his disciples in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the shepherd is going to be smitten and the sheep are going to scatter. And that happens at Calvary. Where'd that come from? Zechariah. Uh, the, the, their Old Testament prophecy of someday I'm going to let you out of the covenant, Israel, and you're going to tell me what it's worth to you. And when you tell me what it's worth to you, I'll snap my covenant and we won't have to have covenant anymore. And what's it worth to you? And they counted out to me 30 pieces of silver. And then we get Judas Iscariot bringing 30 pieces of silver and buying out Jesus. And where is that prophecy? Zechariah. Zechariah is loaded with these prescient moments of what's coming in Jesus. So if we watch for him, we don't wait till Matthew to find Jesus. We find Jesus there. And we just have to watch through that lens of a finished work. And then we can let that story inform stories that Jesus tells. Now, a lot of times we get in trouble with Jesus' stories because we're reading them and we're not reading them from, from the point of view of a, of a Jew who had an Old Testament as their foundation. So we're hearing Jesus tell stories and we might be missing the parallels because we're not thinking Old Testament storytelling time. And all he's doing with parables is laying another layer on top of what they already knew from the Old Testament. I bet a lot of us have never looked at parables that way. We look at them as earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. That's a shoddy definition. It's actually, I'm going to give you a very simple agrarian story that has to do with your 40-hour work week so that you can better understand something you learned in church. Something you learned in Proverbs or Psalms or Zechariah. And then these stories will come alive. And the problem is, is that we don't really know Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah and Zechariah. And therefore, those parables kind of get lost on us and we're filtering them through a misunderstanding. So what I want to do today is I want to start with the Zechariah story. And then I want to go grab a Jesus parable and lay it on top of that foundation. And you'll, I think you'll watch, you'll put those glasses on with me, that new covenant lens. And when you put those new covenant lenses on, that Old Testament story starts to shift. It'll be an amazing thing where it starts to have a meaning it couldn't have without Jesus and that it'll never have again because you've already have Jesus in here and therefore that story gets filtered through what we understand of him. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 says, and one of probably the most famous verses in the entire Old Testament. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might 
nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to answer out loud. But how many of you have heard the verse? It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Probably 99% of the room has heard that quoted. Probably most of us didn't realize it was Zechariah 4, 6. It sounds like a real New Testament scripture. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We gravitate to this verse because it says something that we need. Because I don't always have the might, I don't always have the power, and I don't always have the, fort, the intestinal fortitude, the own personal spirit to pull it off. So what do I need? I need his might, I need his power, I need his spirit. Well, thank God that's in the word. So when I run up against something impossible, I can quote it. Hey, it's not by my might, it's not by my power, it's not by my spirit, says the Lord. He's going to do whatever it is that I need to do. And so if it stood by itself, if we didn't put anything else with this verse, it's a pretty good one to have. It's a pretty good one to have in your pocket. I run into some trouble and I go, hey, I can't do it, but it's not by my might. It's not by my power. It's not by my spirit. But I want you to understand, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists inside of context. It exists somewhere else. And one of the places that it ought to show us it exists is that big name in the middle that we don't know a whole lot about, a guy named Zerubbabel. He doesn't get a lot of play on the scriptures. And so we have to take what the scripture gives us, but we have to go extra testamental. That's a word that means we've got to run outside the Bible and go find some historical sources for Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is a character whose ministry, for lack of a better term, happened in the 6th century B.C. Somewhere between the years 540 and 520 B.C., Zerubbabel led 42,000 Jews back from Babylonian captivity into the land that we would call Judea or Israel near what we would call the city of Jerusalem. And as they filtered their way back into the city of Jerusalem, they found that the generation they had been gone, the generation plus that they had been gone, had found invaders in the land. People were taking possession that didn't live there before. And so now the exiles or the refugees of, of the Jewish homeland are coming home and they don't have a place, and they don't even have a place to worship because that famous temple that Solomon built way back in the Old Testament has been raised, taken to the ground. And so the Jews don't have anywhere to worship. They don't have anywhere to offer up sacrifices. They don't have anywhere to store their records. And Zerubbabel leads the charge. And he takes on what is pretty much an impossible task with no money, no real funds, no real support. He begins the process of rallying 42,000 Jewish people to rebuild the temple, what will become Zerubbabel's temple, and then ultimately be rebuilt, refashioned, upgraded by Herod. Remember Herod's temple? That's the one Jesus runs around in. We're going to put Jesus in that temple in just a minute from Mark. That's started by this guy, Zerubbabel. Now, the reason Zechariah 4, 6 is so important is because Zerubbabel can't figure out how to build it. I don't have the money, I don't have the tools, I don't have the manpower, I don't have government support, I don't have anything. I have a dream, but it's impossible. I can't pull this off. So the Holy Spirit visits him and says, guess how you're not going to do it? You're not going to do it by might, you're not going to do it by power. If it's going to get done, it's going to happen by my Spirit says the Lord. So if this is truly from me, I'm going to do the building. This is where you get that phrase, unless the Lord builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. That's something we take as a principle for marriage. Why not? It's a good principle. But it has a root in, you can't build this temple without money. You can't build this temple without tools. You can't build this temple without equipment. But what if it has nothing to do with what you can do and everything to do with what I can do, says the Lord? Well, then anything's possible. The impossible becomes possible. So it's not by might of Zerubbabel or the power of Zerubbabel, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, that's the context of the phrase. And that's how we've been comforted by it. And why not? It ought to comfort us. And we ought to take it with us to comfort us. But there's something else happening in the story. Look at the next verse. Who are you? Now note the quotes. The quotes at the top of the verse tell us that someone is speaking. Who are you, O great mountain? With, before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. This 
adds a little twist. It adds a little color to our verse. Because remember, Zerubbabel's trying to rebuild a temple and he can't. And God says to him, forget it. It's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. There's no way you're going to be able to do it. So God speaks. That's the quote marks. And God says to the mountain that stands in front of Zerubbabel, hey, great mountain, you shall become a plain. Zerubbabel's going to knock you down and he's going to bring forth the capstone. We're going to save the word capstone because it's a confusing word out of the English from the Hebrew that's mistranslated and no one knows what a capstone is anyway. All right, sounds like a stone you put on the top. And that doesn't make a lot of sense when you're building from the bottom up. And he goes, okay, forget capstone for a moment, but look at what's going to happen. We're going to shout grace, grace to it. So whatever you're going to do, it's going to happen because you speak to something bigger than yourself, but you don't just speak, hey, I can do it. You speak something specific. Grace, grace, which by the way, is a decidedly new covenant term. And here you are in Zechariah 4 with a decidedly new covenant voice screaming at a mountain, grace, grace, because the mountain's too big for me to get over it. So how am I going to get over it? Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. Yet, beautifully, I get to be involved because I get to shout something to the mountain. So let's deal with the mountain. And let's don't deal with the mountain from a geographic standpoint. Mountains are big. Sometimes... It's impossible for you to get over it, certainly on your own. It's a team effort. And maybe it's just too big anyhow. In the ancient world, there were mountains that were, of course, impossible to climb over without modern equipment. So a mountain represented something too big for you. There's a reason it's not a bump. There's a reason it's not a hill. There's a reason it's a mountain. And when the imagery of mountain comes to the surface in the Bible, beginning from the Old Testament all the way through the New it's something too big for you to do anything about. It's why Hebrews 12 says you're not on Mount Sinai. You are on Mount Zion. Guess what? It's too big for you to do anything about this. The law can't save you and neither can you. You're not on that mountain. But you are on Zion, which is the home of Jesus the mediator and all the angels and God the judge and the church of the firstborn. And he loves you and you can't do anything about it. That's why it's a mountain and not a bump. You're not at the ch first church of the bump <laughs> where you could easily walk off if you want to. You're at a mountain and mountains are big. And in Old Testament literature, they meant something enormous. Now, one of the failures of our lens in Western literature in the church is that we read and write literally. We don't read and write metaphorically. We don't read and write allegorically. And we struggle with it in the Western world. We, str we struggle. It's why a lot of us struggle with poetry because poetry doesn't write literally. Poetry writes in hyperbole or allegory or metaphor. And if you don't think metaphorically, the best you can do is think rhythmically so the roses must be red and the violets must be blue that doesn't mean anything bigger than roses are red violets are blue and when you have you noticed you walk out and go violets aren't blue <laughs> violets are purple and that shows you you don't know how to read metaphorically <laughs> so if that crossed your mind when i said violets are blue you go no they're not congratulations this next part is for you so the Bible is about understanding big themes, but in ways that us little people can grab them. And to do that, you use big language. And so sometimes you need God. If I were to say to you, some of you need God to part the sea for you this week. You know, surely, that I don't mean you're hoping that God literally separates a body of water this week so you can drive through it. But what you probably know that means is I need God to do something big this week to take care of what's in front of me because I can't get around it. And so that's understanding that allegory. Mountains are that way. When they drop themselves into the literature of the Bible is to tell the reader there's something in front of you you can't go around, you can't go under, you can't go through, you can't go over. So now what are you going to do? And the answer is because it's a mountain, you're going to do nothing. Because you can't get around it. You can't go over it. Now, you can't think in modern terms. You go, well, I'll just get in an airplane and fly over. Think in their terms. And so it's too big for me. I don't know what to do. And so God's answer to Zerubbabel is, it's a great mountain. It's a big mountain, but it shall become a plain. And so 
what the language is saying is you're standing in front of something too big, but I know how to knock it down. I will knock it down. Now, there's a couple reasons mountains exist in the Bible. All right? One reason that the mountain exists in biblical literature is because it's a challenge mountain. God is asking you, are you willing to pick up something bigger than yourself and take on meaning in your existence today? Here's a for instance. Abram, take Isaac, your son, your only son, and climb up that mountain and sacrifice him at the top of that mountain to me. And Abraham gathers his son and the wood and the knife and the fire and they walk up the mountain and Isaac says, Dad, we have the the wood and the knife and the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abram's faith comes out in the middle of his action and he says, Son, don't worry, God shall provide himself a lamb. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, guess what was walking up the other side of the mountain the entire time? A ram whose horns are caught in the thicket. And God wasn't wanting the blood of Isaac. God was wanting the meaning of Abraham. The challenge is not that God wants you to go up the mountain and kill something. The challenge is that God wants you to go up the mountain. And so mountains become that challenge in front of you that God goes, life isn't always easy, but it's okay. I'm pulling rams up the other side. If you can get to the top, I'll meet you there. And that'll get your feet out of bed in the morning and put them on the floor and give you a reason to live and give you a reason to work and give you a reason to survive because mountains need climb. Because guess what? We love to climb stuff. We love challenges. That's the human spirit. Tell us we can't go that fast. We work to go that fast. Tell us we can't go that high. We work to get that high. We're seeing it right now in space. You can't land on Mars. We're going to land on Mars. What's next? I don't know. That's the point. It never really ends because that's us putting a mountain in front of us to go, can we climb it? God shines like a bright light from the top of the mountain and says to Moses, come on up here and I'll give you the commands for my people. And Moses walks up the mountain at the top. God cuts covenant because sometimes the mountain is the place where you have to leave the crowd behind to go experience the revelation that only God's going to give you and he won't give it to you in the camp. He'll only give it to you on the mountain. So sometimes the mountain is the end of a journey you had to make to go find out what you couldn't find out at the bottom of the mountain. And sometimes the mountain is, for those of you who will come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. Because there might be a piece of you that you need to lay down And you'll lay it down at the top of this mountain. And the cross that you bear every day will be the reason that you exist. And you'll embrace it while everybody else asks you, how do you do this? How do you make it with this much struggle? And you go, it's what I pick up. And I yoke together with Jesus. And we walk that mountain together. And it isn't too big because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And I'm yoked together with an ox that knows how to pull. And then the mountain becomes a molehill. And how does this relate to what Zerubbabel has to go through? Well, because we have our victory over the mountains in Christ, they get leveled. Let me show you that through a Hebrew literature lens for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. This will give you an idea that we're better with allegory than we think. We just have to get there, all right? Let me bring you along. Verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Hey, every pastor in America needs to read Isaiah. Go back to verse 1 for a second. I want you to sear this into your brain. Every preacher in America, every Sunday school teacher in America, every song leader in America needs to read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 before they walk on the platform. And if they can't do that, don't walk on the platform. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. You don't even need a Jesus lens to figure out what that means. But once you get a Jesus lens, you'll never miss that again. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says the Lord God. Once you get that down, you're ready for whatever allegory comes next because your heart's in the right place. You can handle the words that comes from a God you know loves you better than you can from a God you think wants you to jump through hoops. Right? You know, God loves me. God cares for me. God wants me comforted. I didn't say God wants me comfortable. How can you talk about mountains and comfortable in the same message? You can't. God doesn't want me comfortable, but he wants to comfort me that I can get up that mountain. Comfort, yes, comfort, says my people, and here's why. Verse 2, speak comfort to Jerusalem. Cry out to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In other words, whatever has been taken has been returned double because that's grace. 
Whatever I've lost, I can receive back better than I had before. That's the comfort that comes from knowing who, who I am. Verse 3. The voice of one... Now, this one's going to start sounding real Matthew on you real quick. You ready? The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Where does that, why does that sound like the book of Matthew? Because that sounds very much like a dude that dressed in camel skins and ate locusts and drank wild honey. John the Baptist comes saying this verse, which tells me that whatever happens in the next verse must be the guy John was talking about, right? Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, because here's what he's going to do. Every valley is going to be exalted. Every mountain and every hill is going to be brought low and the crooked place is going to be made straight and the rough place is going to be made smooth. Does that verse mean that when Jesus gets here, either in your past or in your future, there's not going to be any more valleys. There's not going to be any more mountains. There's not going to be any more curvy roads and all gravel roads get paved. No, welcome to allegory. And what does it mean? When Jesus arrives, if you're down, he can pick you up. If it's too big for you to get over, he can knock it down. If it's crooked and curvy, he can straighten it out, make it a little better for you. And he can smooth over some potholes because he knows the road that lies ahead because he's comforting a people in the midst of a comfortless world. Now that's way better than, boy, someday over in the glory land, there won't be any curvy streets. And instead, it's someday in my world, I can see a way where he can straighten out what's curvy, he can lift up what's low, he can knock down what's too big for me. That's reading it through a finished work lens, not an unfinished work lens. And it's understanding that the mountain is never literal, but the mountain is real. All right, let me repeat that. The mountain is never literal, but man is the mountain real. You know the difference? It's not a literal mountain, but it might as well be because it's bigger than you know what to do with. It's bigger than your family knows what to do with. It's bigger than your wallet knows what to do with. It's bigger than your health knows what to do with. It's monstrous. It's impossible. It's Zerubbabel needing to build a temple without a dime. And God then steps in and goes, it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. It's going to be by the Holy Spirit, but you and I are going to do this together because you're going to shout something to it that you truly believe. I don't mean you're going to shout empty platitudes and memorize verses. I want you to believe something so much that it becomes the word that comes out of your mouth about your life and your kids and your marriage and your wallet and your body and your mind. And you believe it so much that you begin to shout it because that's what we do with stuff we really believe is we say it a little louder. And I want you to have that equipment like the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth in Revelation to let your mouth do something powerful in the midst of your stuff so that your mountain is brought low and your crooked path can be made straight. And to do that, now you've got yourself this rock-solid, allegoric Old Testament foundation. So let's go grab ourselves a Jesus moment. All right? Now you're going to put your Jesus lens on. Watch what Jesus does with stuff. What Jesus does with stuff, unforgettable. It's like you walk away and say, can't see that the same way again. Christ has made the difference. Mark chapter 11 Verse 20, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now we're jumping into the end of a story. You can tell because we didn't do anything about last night. It's just in the morning. But all of us know this story. Almost immediately when we see that fig tree dried up by the roots, our mind goes, hey, I know what Jesus did to that tree yesterday, right? All right. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. 21. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. If we stopped right here, and you could, because there's a period, you could say that's a quaint, nice little story. Jesus was like, this is how you take care of the fig tree in a yard. But it really wouldn't mean much to us, especially if we read it literally, because... That means if your apple tree don't give you the kind of apples you want, just walk out in the backyard and curse it. Well, everything's solved except apples, which you still don't have any of. And so the story really doesn't resolve much other than didn't like the tree in the first place. Now I don't have to do anything with it. Just let it rot out and die. and We'll pull it up later. And then Jesus throws something in that seems completely out of left field. Look at the next verse. 
For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, ding, 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 by the way, for all of us Zechariah 4 listeners who've been mountainizing for the last 20 minutes, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that the things that he says will be done, will have whatever he says. Now, if we take Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and we don't know anything about Zechariah 4, and we don't know anything about Isaiah chapter 40, and we don't really know anything about metaphoric mountains, then we might think that if we have enough faith, we can talk to stuff in the natural world and move it out of our way. And I say to you, good luck with your attempt. Let me know how it goes. So you go find your unnatural mountain and believe with all your heart that God's going to knock it down. Give me a call. Keep your phone out. Video record that. Let me know what's happening. You're still going to be there. When the Lord takes you home, believing he's going to knock that physical mountain down because he's not talking about literal mountains. But how many of you know he sure is talking about mountains? Now you know what I'm talking about. There's a big difference in a literal mountain and a mountain. And he's talking about a mountain. But the odd thing is where he drops this in. Where, how do we get from bearing fig trees and moving mountains? Why did he make that turn? Okay, Because it's the end of a greater story. I love biblical sandwich stories. Story, side story, story, these are the same thing. All right? You got something happening here and something happening here that are the same thing. Let me give you, for instance, from Mark 11. Jesus walks into town and he's hungry. So he walks over to a fig tree because he wants to eat a fig off of it. And there are no figs. And so he says, cursed are you fig tree. You shall bring forth no more figs. Story number one. Side story. And in the morning, Jesus came back to the fig tree that had no figs. And Peter said, look, there's a tree that dried up yesterday. And Jesus said, have faith in God. You could even say to the mountain, be removed, cast in the sea. Don't doubt in your heart. Believe whatever it is you say. You shall have whatever it is you say. And you go, what in the world happened in the middle? Because whatever happened in the middle probably had something to do with what was happening on the front and the back. And what happened in the middle is that Jesus walked into the temple and he saw money changers blocking the access for the average man to get to his father and the house of prayer had become a den of thieves and Jesus fashions a whip and knocks over some tables and says how dare you keep people from accessing my father and you say well what's that got to do with a tree because Israel's allegorical story told them they were the fig tree of the earth and they were supposed to be food for the nations and they failed and in John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine and you are the branches. I am the true vine. Who's the fake vine? All of you that think you're the vine are no longer get to be the vine. Vines and fig trees were synonymous language in the Old Testament. Let everyone set under his fig and vine. That was an allegory for the favor of God. Jesus goes, I, John 15, I am the true favor of God. No one else is the true favor of God. But Israel had the idea that they were the fig tree. They were the ones who were God's chosen. And when Jesus went to them to receive fruit, were there fruit? No. He walks into their temple. There's no fruit. So he knocks their tables over and walks back out to the tree. Can you now tell what the tree represents? the barrenness of whatever's going on in that temple. And that temple originated at Sinai. It was a performance, works-based, religious experience where you climbed up to God, not where God climbed down to you. And it is mirrored every time we preach to people, you better do if you want God to bless you. And Jesus walked into that temple and knocked the tables over and he bookended it by removing the fig tree that had no fruit. And what he's saying to his disciples is, the greatest obstacle to people receiving me, I'm gonna to speak to you for a moment, through, try through what I see Jesus saying in Mark, okay? Jesus says to his disciples, the greatest obstacle that people have to receiving me is their own performance, their own works, the law. And I come to them to receive fruit and they have none. And do you know why they have none? Because they've made my father's house a den of thieves and they don't give people access to the father. And if you don't give people access to the father, there's no fruit on you worth having. And the only way for me to get rid of that is to speak to that mountain and knock it out. So guess what you need to do? When you come up against something that's blocking, that's hindering, 
that's too big for you to overcome. I want you to do what I did. I spoke to the fig tree and cursed it and it fell. He said, but you get to speak to mountains. Now, they have Zechariah 4 here and here because they were raised on it. So when Jesus says to them, say to a mountain, their mind goes, Zerubbabel had a mountain. And God told him it won't be by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that all he has to do is speak to that mountain. And what was it he said to that mountain? If I could remember what Zerubbabel said to that mountain, and then as your mind goes back, you realize that Zerubbabel speaks a new covenant word. Because the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. So what God told Zerubbabel to do was proclaim forth what could only be found in Jesus. And as you proclaim what can only be found in Jesus, there's not a mountain you encounter that has anything it can do against you. And they could never understand that in Zechariah 4, but they can understand it in Mark 11, standing next to a scrawny, dried up, cursed fig tree, because Jesus said, never again shall the denial of access to my Father be what blocks you from the blessing. And if you see something in that way, if you see a mountain too big for you to transverse, if you see a mountain too big for you to get over, if you see something that blocks you from my Father, pour my daddy's grace on that mountain. Speak, the, speak what only comes through Christ into that mountain. It is not a get... Mark eleven twenty three is not a get anything you want if you can just memorize enough Bible verses. Scripture. It is a... Don't let anything stand in your way that keeps you from understanding who you are in the Father kind of Scripture. So what should you do against it? Meet the man of grace. Know the man of grace. Proclaim the man of grace. Put the man of grace into the situation and trust that whatever's bigger than you isn't bigger than him. Because he walked up that mountain with his cross and he paid that price. Go to Zechariah 4, 7 one more time. I want to deal with that difficult word, capstone. Because we can do better. Who are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he, he is Zerubbabel. So he is you. You get to bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The capstone is a word we can't figure out from the Hebrew, so what we do is we borrow the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. By the way, when Jesus stood up in Luke chapter 4 and read from the scroll of Isaiah, he was reading from the Septuagint. So he would have probably been reading from the Greek. Most likely he was reading from the Septuagint. That's what most of our New Testament writers read from, a Greek translation. And the Greek translation of Zechariah 4, 4, 7 says he's going to bring forth with the stone. He's going to bring forth the stone of inheritance with a shout of grace, grace to it. And while that may not help you much, it at least has precedent in the Bible. And that's all we need. And the stone of inheritance was what Israel did when they claimed a piece of property. Joshua came out of the Jordan River and he pulled 12 rocks out of it, remember? And he set a statue, a, a, a little tower of 12 rocks up and he declared this land belongs to the people of God. That's called a stone of inheritance. There's a text in the Torah that says, don't ever move your neighbor's stone of inheritance. If your neighbor puts a property line down and says, this is my property, you are not allowed under Jewish law to move it over a few feet because you need to put your swing set in. You know, like my fence needs to be right there, so I'm gonna just going to slide that rock over. And God said, you don't get to do that because it's theft of what belongs to your neighbor. It's his inheritance. You don't get his inheritance. You get your inheritance. So when you get to Zechariah 4, he says, you know how you're going to bring the mountain down? Through your inheritance, which is grace. Grace. Now, listen, you can't have an inheritance if you don't belong to the family. So you need to know what you know what you need to rest yourself in today. I'm one of the sons. I'm one of the daughters of God. I belong in his house. If anybody gets to eat the fatted calf, it's me. And I see a mountain in front of me 
that is designed to stop me, to slow me down. I'm going to do everything I can to climb it because there is some things that are in my might and in my power and in my spirit. But when I get up there and realize that it ain't going to happen by my might and by my power and by my spirit, I'm left with one thing. And that is to take my inheritance up that mountain with me and begin to declare what I know belongs to me. And that's the man of grace. And the man of grace is my answer. Understanding who he is, is my answer. And this mountain is no more than a fig tree that refuses to give fruit. It can't stop me from access to my father. And I'm gonna rest in who he is. He's like, Pastor Paul, how do I take this and apply it in my life? Meet the man of grace, know Jesus. Know that you belong in the family. I'm one of the sons and daughters of God. That's my inheritance stone. It belongs to me. Nothing can take away what belongs to me. Realize that if the mountain is one you can climb, you have an obligation to climb it. So get to stepping. Because otherwise it's an apathy that is beneath the sons of God. And once you start to climb it and you realize it is a mountain that can take only His might, His power, and His spirit, then you throw your stone of inheritance down on that ground and claim it as yours and say, this is my spot. I belong. And if he wants me on the other side of that mountain, grace, grace is what's going to bring it down. Otherwise, I'll pitch my tent right here because I'm one of the sons of God. We don't have to worry about where we are, or where we're going. We understand who we are. We allow him to do that work in us. He is our grace, grace. He is our shouts of grace, grace. Rest in him. Father, I thank you today for this word that has been so real in me and I have faced my own mountains, many of which you have taught me I can walk up and walk over. But I, like everyone in this room, have faced those that will never be able to be walked over by human might, power, and effort. And for them... We have to do as Jesus did to that fig. We have to look at that mountain, that obstacle. And we have to realize if we're going to get over it, it's going to take the grace of God. It's going to take knowing Jesus and that we are part of his family. And if we could just comprehend that and bring that into our spirit, there's no mountain that cannot become a plain in our presence. I'm not asking you right now, Father, to knock mountains down in front of these people. That would take the glory away from them. I'm asking you to give this group of people the understanding that they are your sons and daughters so that they can start to talk to their mountains. For too long, we've come into, your, into the house and hoped that somebody else would knock our stuff over for us. But Father, somebody in this house can't go into our house. We do. So let's walk out of here knowing who we are, knowing what we are, and knowing our destiny. And I thank you that we get to see this through what Jesus has done on our behalf. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. I love you. I thank the Lord for you. I thank Dad for this opportunity. You've been wonderful this morning to just listen and and, and kind of soak that word in. I think together we wrestled out some good stuff. Maybe you leave inspired and excited about seeing Jesus. I want to encourage you in your walk. And in your journey, I want you to know that you're loved. I want you to know that the Father cares for you. I want you to know that you are blessed and favored beyond measure. I hope that you don't have to spend one second of the rest of your life dropping the bad baggage you picked up about a good God. Because for too long, we've been receiving bad information about a good God. And let me tell you, if you hear it and it doesn't sound like a good, good Father, rebuke it in Jesus' name. Don't amen it. Don't accept it. But if it's a good God, take it. Put it in your life. Put it in your heart. Let it transform your home. Let it transform your marriage. Let it transform your family. There's nothing like a good, good father. and He follows you everywhere you go. Listen for that voice. You're blessed, you're favored, and you're loved. Amen. Do you believe it? Yes. All right. God bless you. Love you, church.